This is the bit that you probably thought you were signing up for when you signed up to do a finite element course, the bit where we actually solve a PDE, um, or at least talk about how to do it. So uh, we are going to solve a PDE, and it is essentially a legal requirement that all finite element courses start by solving this PDE. Uh, that is for the very simple reason that it's the simplest one you can possibly do. Uh, you might have thought that it would be even simpler if I chopped off the U there and just did Poisson. Uh, the issue with that is if you solve Poisson's equation with only Neumann boundary conditions, it's ill-posed. It's only uh, well-posed up to constant solutions. So we'll do that one next in order to work out how to do Dirichlet boundary conditions. But we'll wimp out to start with and solve uh, what I would call the Helmholtz equation because I'm basically a fluids person. If you are basically a structures person, you say that's cheating and that sign changes. Um, this one is much nicer because that's a positive definite operator and the operator in front of that is the identity which is a positive definite operator. So if I add two positive definite operators, I've still got a positive definite operator and then I can use conjugate gradients and everything's nice. If you change the sign on this, that becomes a negative definite operator, which you are adding to a positive definite operator, and you typically have some sort of constant in here. And this becomes an indefinite operator, and all sorts of things can go wrong in your solver at that point, and the conditions for being well, well posed are difficult, and life is not really so fun. So we're going to pretend to be fluid people and do the easy one. So that's your, boundary, uh, so that's your equation, and this is... Uh, the homogeneous Neumann boundary condition. So Neumann, because it's a derivative, and in vector calculus, multi-dimensions, that means a derivative in the direction going through the boundary in most circumstances. And homogeneous simply means that the boundary condition is zero. Uh, in finite element land, this is also, for reasons that are about to become obvious, known as the do-nothing boundary condition. And so hopefully, this is not a particular surprise, because hopefully Colin has already shown you this equation and how you derive the finite element method. So as someone once said in a finite element talk, if you're a finite element person, the bell rings, you salivate, you, uh, you multiply by a test function and integrate by parts, because that's the only trick in the book. So that's what we do. We multiply by an arbitrary test function from the finite element space V, and the second derivative gets integrated by parts, so now I only have first derivatives, and because my function space is a subspace of H1, if you've been paying attention in Collins half of the course, that means that that derivative is legal, and what I've done is above board and kosher, and all of the coerciveness proofs fall out, and we actually have a solution. When you integrate by parts, you get a boundary term. So you lose one of the derivatives, and you get what was left dotted with the normal integrated over the surface. And if you look at that bit of this, that looks suspiciously like the boundary condition. So the way we apply the boundary condition is we substitute the boundary condition value in on the boundary, and that amounts to substituting zero into that integrand, and so it's zero and it goes away. So that's why it's called the do-nothing boundary condition. Uh, if you had inhomogeneous Neumann boundary condition, so a Neumann boundary condition where the right-hand side was not zero, what you would get is an integral here, and the integral wouldn't have any u's in it. So that would turn up as a forcing term on the right-hand side. So in fact, morally, all boundary conditions are homogeneous because all inhomogeneous boundary conditions just show up as a different forcing term. So that's actually, in some essence, similar to something you learned in probably first year university when you did differential equations, where basically all of the interesting stuff happens in the homogeneous differential equation, and the inhomogeneous case is just a special case added to the homogeneous case. Same sort of thing happens here. Um, so that gets you weak form of the partial differential equation. And in order to actually do something with that, what we do is we're going to substitute in for bases. 
And there's actually two functions here which are in a finite element space. One of them is u, which is the solution, so that's the thing we're trying to find. And the other one is v, which is the test function, so it's an arbitrary function from v. They behave in the same way in the next step, but for slightly different reasons. So u is the easy one. We just take a basis for our finite element space, and we observe that the function u is simply equal to uj phi j summed. So that's this. And every time this turns up, I substitute that in. The same thing is true for my forcing function f if I use a forcing function from a finite element space. You can also use an arbitrary function on the right-hand side and just evaluate it at quadrature points, but we'll keep our life simple and use one from a finite element space. So f is equal to fk phi k. Same story. Uh, I also get to replace v by a basis function, and I get to do that and lose the vi's. So that's for a slightly deeper reason, and that is that recall that this statement is true for all v in v. Well, this statement is linear in v. It's always true. If you multiply by a function and integrate, that's a linear operation. So you may or may not be linear in the solution variable. So if you are a third year for the purposes of this course, all PDEs are linear in the solution variable. If you are a fourth year, that is substantially less true, because uh, that's what's in the mastery exercise. But right now we're doing a linear PDE, so u and v are both linear. But if your PDE is nonlinear, it means it's nonlinear in the solution doesn't make it nonlinear in the test function. You are always, always, always linear in the test function by definition of what it means to be a weak form. So what that means is that this equation is just a linear combination of equations in the basis. Because all the operators are linear, you can always take the vi's outside the integrals. And so in particular, if the equation is satisfied for all of the basis functions, then it's satisfied for every equation in V. And that is what taking a finite space V gets you. Right, so if you looked at an original weak form equation where the test functions are, say, just in H1. H1 is an infinite dimensional function space. And so the basis is, inf is infinitely big. You have to solve infinitely many equations. You're computationally out of luck. But here, because it's finite dimensional, it's sufficient to solve for each equation in the basis. So what this means is that this is going to define a set of equations, one equation for each test function. And it's a finite dimensional set of equations. It's a finite dimensional linear set of equations. So it's going to turn into a matrix vector equation, and we know how to solve those. So that's what I did there. And actually, also, now we are, in this case, linear in U. And so when you're linear in U, that means you can take U outside the brackets. So this is just this integral times u, and I can rewrite that as a matrix vector multiplication because that's just the dot product of whatever this is with the vector uj. So this is how I get this. So that's the system you're going to build when you build that system. So you know this guy because it's defined by this. You know what the basis functions are. So that's well defined. And f, you know what the basis functions are. You know what the forcing function is, by definition. So you know how to get this one. So the only thing you don't know in here is u. So you build a and f, and you solve the equation a u equals f by just calling a matrix solver. So this is not a numerical linear algebra class. A numerical linear algebra class was last term taught by Eric. <laughs>